You guys see that little red square down there in the corner? It says subscribe. Why don't you click on that for me? Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Trapped. How to get started trapping. We're going to jump right into this again. I have a script so I don't get sidetracked and start rambling off for 40 minutes. But uh, this episode is going to be about getting to know your traps. You know, these are, it's not going to be all inclusive on every trap that's out there. This is going to be your most common traps that you're going to deal with. I'm going to go super simple. How to set the traps, safety of the, you know, to con con safety considerations while you're setting the trap. And uh, we'll go over each type of trap that pretty much is most of the traps that I use. So that's mostly what you will be dealing with. Before anything else, of course, you know, you've got your fur takers permit, you've been through trapper education, know your laws on what traps, because each state varies on what traps you can use for what animals. So, you know, here in Ohio, we our, our, our law on coil spring traps is five and five eighths inches, unless that's the, your, your jaw spread, unless you have three swivel points, if you've got at least three swivel points, then it's six inches. So, know your laws, read your law book, before you go out and buy traps, depending on what you're going after. So first up, we're going to start off with the coil spring trap. They come in a variety of sizes, from ones, one and a half. So that's an old Victor, one and a half. You can see that's a it's a fairly small trap. This is a good, great trap for muskrat, mink, raccoons. Probably be okay for fox. There's guys that catch coyotes in them. They will hold a coyote, but I would not set them for coyotes. You know, all the way up to, you know, here's the, this is a coil spring trap here. This isn't the biggest ones they make. These are what I've got. This is an MB750. I use these for beaver. That's the only, the only time I can use this trap in Ohio is if it's completely submerged in water. This is a, uh, this is a big trap. It's a powerful trap. It has got four coil springs on it and it's a bear to set, so I'm not going to be doing demonstrations with this. And uh, now of course, you, one of your most tra popular traps out there, your MB550, you can see the size of it. It's still a good size trap. It's 550, it's a five and a half inch jaw spread. Now, uh, get into, uh, let's talk about the trap a little bit first before we get into how to set it. Uh, one thing you want to consider is, of course, what animals you're going after. You, if, if you're going out for your first year and you're targeting raccoons, you don't need this. You absolutely don't need this. You know, I mean, you can see the size difference. You know, this is the MB550, this is an MB750. Side by side comparison. You know, you don't need something like this for raccoons. If you're going after coons, you need some trap. If your first year trap is going to be in a creek, you need something like this. This is a Victor one and a half. You know, that will be plenty good enough for coons, mink, muskrat, and like I said, fox, you know, would be fine. Yeah, if you're going to go with fox, if you're going after fox, and I've held a lot of coyotes in these traps here. This is a Bridger 165, and it's, uh, I, actually, these are the first traps that I ever bought, and I caught fox and coyotes with these, and it, I never had an issue holding a coyote with the, with the Bridger 165. But, uh, you know, you want to definitely consider what animal you're going after and what size trap you're going to be using for that animal, or what size trap you need. Uh, if you're going after coyotes, you want to look at my opinion, and this is all opinion based, you ask 50 different trappers, you're going to get 50 different answers. My opinion for coyotes, you need at least a number two trap for if you're going like Duke and Bridger and, you know, of course, M, you know, Minnesota brand, MB. If I say MB, that's what it is, Minnesota brand. It's Minnesota Trap Line Products makes them. Um, you need, you know, MB 550. They make a 450, 550, 650, 750. I think they make a 650. 
Maybe not. I know Duke's making a 650. But uh, anyways, you know, if you go on, I know F and T, and I would imagine Minnesota Trap Line Products has the same thing. If you're looking at their traps online, it's got what they're the animals that that trap is recommended for, so you can find it there. Um, I'm going to try not to make this go too long, guys. So just bear with me. Um, trap prep and anchoring. If you're going after mink, muskrat, something water-based, then you know you're going to be setting in creeks. Mink and muskrat typically guys like to stake them out into deep water because this trap is heavy enough that if you catch a mink or a muskrat, their first instinct is to go to water. Well, for muskrat anyways. I'm not a mink trapper, so ask me that next year whenever I start learning about them. But uh, we'll say muskrat anyways, we'll go to deep water. And if you've got these staked in deep water, you know, then the muskrat's going to go out there and he's going to drown very quickly. It's a quick, humane death, but uh, that's how you want to stake these. These are, you know, Jeff Haggerty makes these. Check him out on J3O Outdoors. These are the Hags brackets. These, you got a hole here. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go through the whole breakdown of it. You know, if you're interested in doing something like that, his website, he's got the whole breakdown on what these Hags brackets do. You can also set these up on just a swivel and a drowning cable or a drowning wire. You could have it wired, you could have it staked up at the bank, throw a, a cinder block or something out into the deep water, have a wire running where this, we'll get into drowning locks here in a little bit with beaver traps. But uh, you have it set up on a drowning system. And if you're setting these on land for raccoons, you know, you can get a good rebar tea stake or just a regular rebar stake you know, whether you're using a regular swivel, this will fit through the swivel, this will fit through, also fit through the hags brackets. You can stake that into the ground, that'll hold a raccoon right there. As long as you've got fairly solid ground there, that'll hold a raccoon. So there's that option on staking. Um, then if you're going after coyotes, we're going to be looking to do more of a, like we talked about in the last episode, the uh, the wolf fang type earth anchors, or the cross stake, you can get the cross stake swivels. I talked about this on the last one, so I'm not going to show it. Uh, but what I like to use, especially going after coyotes, is the wolf fangs. We talked about that. You know, it's just you can make them yourself. Or you can make the anchors, the cables yourself anyways. You know, it's just a 12, 14 inch piece of cable that gets drove down into the ground. You pull it up and it sits there solid. It's not going anywhere. But for trap preparation for your, for any of them really, my water traps and my land traps, I do the same thing. I dye them and wax them. This is the way that I do mine. Like I said last time, you can you can paint them full metal jacket, however you want to deal with. That's that's your trap prep for these. Yearly, I die and wax my traps. I just I like to come out here, drink a few beers, and die and wax my traps. One thing that I messed up on my first year, and I, I wasn't thinking, and I'll give you guys this tip now. Make sure you have an area outside where you're hanging your traps because. Uh, I dyed mine in here, or well not in here, out in the main part of the barn for my lawn mowers, you know, all kinds of different stuff. You know, I change oil in here all the time with my cars. And uh, I, I dyed my traps, let them dry, and then I waxed my traps. And I had a system set up inside where they were hanging and the wax would dry. Wax will pick up any smell around it. I had so many problems my first year with dugout traps and that's what I ended up realizing was where I'd left my traps hanging inside, they had picked up the smell of my barn. So whenever you die and wax your traps, hang them up outside. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. 
Laminated jaws. A lot of you may not understand, you know, when guys talk about laminating the jaws on the track. I don't have any here that I've done or that's been homemade done. So let's look at jaws on the track. You see, this is an old Victor one and a half. You see how thin that is? That's thin metal. You know, that's, if you get a coyote that's going to be pulling on that all day, you run a pretty good chance. And, and not necessarily, but there's a better chance that he's going to cut his leg or something, you know, after being in a trap for four hours, yanking on it. You run a good chance of him injuring his leg, getting a cut. Laminated jaws. Pay attention to the thickness of these traps. Now these are not technically laminated jaws on these MBs, but it's the same principle. These are cast iron. These are made from cast. And you see how thick that is. That is a thicker jawed trap. Basically, what that does is cuts down on the. It spreads the pressure out a little bit. So it's less chance of the animal cutting its leg. And if you've watched some of my other videos, I, I showed up close that there was no cuts from these traps at all. There was no blood. And it also, with it being a wider, thicker area, it allows more blood flow. You don't have to worry so much about cutting the blood flow off to the foot. So that's what your laminated jaws are about. You can, uh, I, and check your state laws because that's, you know, I, I told you about Ohio's law where it's, you know, five and five eighths or six inches. Well, that's another part of it too is your jaw thickness. You know, it can be six inches as long as it's a laminated jaw. Uh, and you definitely want, you know, I, I will tell you, you know, a lot of, I was the same way, like I said, the first traps I bought, were these Bridger 165s and like I said they held a coyote just fine a lot of them did not last more than one season because they're just not I mean you look at you know your base plate isn't too horrible on it your levers are not near as heavy duty as these your jaws are not near as heavy duty as these so you know you want if you're going after coyotes you want a heavy duty trap, you're better off to spend the money and go with, you know, go with an MB, go with something that has been proven. If you like to mess around, you can get, you can take a Bridger 165 and you can laminate the jaws, you can base plate it, which these are base plated somewhat, but uh, you can uh, bubble weld on the, where your jaw comes through. Put your little tack on each each one of these. That way, they're not able to pull them out. And I mean, they, they would do fine. So you need a heavy duty trap for coyotes. Okay, offset versus regular jaws. This is something that really it's going to come down to preference. Um, I've not had an issue with either one. I will probably stick with offset jaws, just because I've never had a problem with them. The difference in looking at, let me find a trap that's not filthy, okay. This is a Duke 550, offset jaw. This is an MB 550, regular jaw. And you see, that regular jaw, it closes tight. You know, there's no offset in that. This Duke 550, that's closed all the way, and it's got that little gap in there. The theory is, you know, that puts a little less pressure on the contact point of the animal. Some guys claim that an offset jaw does more damage because once the coyote gets pulling back, he, he's got enough room that he can pull back and forth and that will kind of do like a sawing effect on it. So, yeah, you know, like I said, I'm no trap expert, I'm just telling you what. My understanding is, take it with a grain of salt, but that's my, my understanding on these. Okay, I'm gonna switch over to the other camera, and I'm gonna show you real quick. I'm gonna show you guys the safe way on setting the jaws. Yeah, I can throw it up here on my leg, 
and or setting the traps, not setting the jaws. I can throw it up here on my leg and set it and show you guys that, but if you've never set a trap before, I don't want to show you that. I want to show you the safe way and we'll discuss the safety. Let me go to the other camera. I've got it set up and we will uh, we will do that. Um, since I had the MB out, I figured I'd go ahead and use this. They're all the same principle, you know. An MB's got a, got a night latch. Other ones don't, but they all set the same way. Night latched or not, you know. So, what you want to do first to safely do this, here, here's your safety considerations. In between the jaws is bad. Under the, under the jaws, you're fine. The thing can snap all day. So you want to keep your fingers out from in between these jaws. You press down the levers. You get turned to where I'm not blocking the camera. Flip your dog over. See, that's your dog right here. Flip that over. You press down on that. You lift the pan up. See, right now, yes, my fingers are between these jaws, but so is my palms. So if that thing closed, it's going to throw my hands out of there. But that's basically, that's your set trap right there. That's how you do it. Now, I can set that trap off by pressing down on the pan. I put my thumb underneath. You know, I can do this all day long and I'm, I'm at no risk. You put your fingers in here, bad. <laughs> so don't don't do that. So that's your coil spring trap. That's the end of this lesson on coil spring traps. All right. Up next we have long spring traps. Kind of the same concept, somewhat of a you got jaws that close on the animal's foot. It's another foothold trap. Yeah, you can call it what you want, guys. I, I, it's just, to me, coil spring trap, long spring trap. You know, when you're talking to people that are on the fence about hunting, a leg hold and foot hold may bother people. If you call it a coil spring trap, it's less bothersome. So just like with coil springs, your long springs come in all shapes and sizes. Well, I'm not going to say all shapes, all different sizes. So you got a single long spring. This is probably one and a half. The pan's all rusted, so I'm not really sure. This is a number four single long spring. This is a number four double long spring. See, it's got the two long springs on it. This is a very good trap for beavers. Uh, some states where it would be legal, this would be a good trap for coyotes. It would hold them very well. But the concept is quite the same. Um, same trap prep. You know, you die in wax. Um, you could do the same thing with the jaws. You could laminate the jaws on a, on a long spring. Um, same way, you know, heavy duty. You want heavy duty, heavier duty trap, like a double long spring for coyotes. Um, and trap size for species, you know, you, this would be great for mink, muskrat, coons. I wouldn't want to trap a coyote with a single long spring. I would go at least a double. Even big beaver, you know, a trap this size would probably hold, but I don't like risking a probably. So I would not even set this. This trap was given to me by somebody. And uh, I wouldn't even risk it on this trap I've never used, and I don't really know that I will, will ever use it. I mean, it's just, you know, it would probably hold a beaver, but I'd rather have a double long spring in there. Um, single long spring trap, and you guys got to bear with me because my hand's still kind of messed up. But... The way these work, you compress the spring like so. Here, I'll see if I can put my leg up here on this chair. That way I don't switch cameras. You get the trap opened up. Keep your hands out here. Once once that spring's compressed, I can hold this all day. I mean, that's hardly any any pressure at all. 
and then you can come up underneath again. Uh, I just put my thumb in there, but you know what I mean. Get that, get that latch on the dog right there. Then once you've got that in there, you adjust your pan. That's set pretty good. You'd set that for muskrat, raccoons, what have you. And it operates the same way. Animal comes along, steps on the pan, snap-o. We've already won over staking. If you're in water, you know, take it to a drowning system or stake it out, you know, into deep water. One thing that I've been seeing a lot of, and I don't know, probably a lot of it's got to do with YouTube. A lot of new people are getting into trapping. And I've been seeing a lot of guys losing their traps. You know, you'll hear about, oh, well, you know, I lost this trap. There's signs that an animal's there and it pulled the stake. Guys, don't tie off with like 16 gauge wire. You know, that's not going to hold it. Don't use, you know, telephone wire or something like that. Get a good, you know, 11. 11 gauge wire would probably be all right. 9 gauge wire would be better if you're going to wire a trap. And make sure that, because you might be setting for muskrats or mink in a creek, but a raccoon comes along, he's interested in that too, and he's going to get caught in that trap. If you've got this tied to a piece of uh, an old red brick out in the middle of the water, he's going to drag that thing off. And now you've just lost the trap for one, You've got an animal out there that's in, you know, he's walking around with a trap on his foot. So what's going to happen to that animal? You know, it's what you got to think about. You know, it's, and once it's already happened, it's too late to think about, well, you know, I should have done this. Do it from the beginning. I mean, my first time sitting for beaver, I, I didn't talk to anybody like I told you guys. You know, it wasn't. There wasn't a lot of YouTube videos around and stuff, but uh, I tied a 20 pound weight to a drowning cable, tossed it out in deep water, staked my trap up. And I, I did everything I thought right. The thing I did wrong, that wasn't enough weight. So I get out there to my spot where I'm trapping at, and there's a, he weighed very first one I ever caught was 67 pounds. He had drugged the weight up onto the bank. He was laying there on the bank on his back asleep. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, I didn't lose the beaver, but I learned then and there that was not enough weight. So now I use, uh, I've got buddies that are mechanics, and I use uh, brake rubbers off of trucks. That's what I use for my drowning weights. This year I'm going to go to drowning rods because that just to me seems a lot easier than uh, dealing with all these drowning weights. So that's our explanation on long springs. Uh, I think I covered everything I wanted to cover on that. Next type of trap and just like with everything else always you've got a huge variety of sizes. It's your body grip traps. This one is a 110. Don't really know why they started calling it a 110, but that was what they were first called, I guess, for Kana Bears for 110s. So it became the, the size. So you got a 110 trap, you got a single spring on the side of it. You can move up to like a 120, would have a second spring over here. Why would you want that second spring? Well, if you're sitting for muskrat, same thing with you know, anchoring your traps correctly. If you're setting for muskrat or mink, if you're in a spot above the water where there's a chance that a raccoon's going to stick his head through there because a raccoon can't get his head through there, and you're going to catch him, you're not real likely to kill that, that muskrat quickly or that raccoon quickly with a 110. The 120 with a second spring over here, that's more likely. So then you get into, this is a 155, and I've got this, yeah, it's got safeties on it just like, uh, 
just like your uh, bigger traps because these are some pretty stout springs on them honestly but uh yeah so you've got those that's a 155 you've got 220s that's a bigger trap be good for otter some beaver there's guys that'll set them out you know in creeks that they're trapping for muskrat that maybe there's a chance of an otter being in there also and then your big boys your 330s trust me guys you want to know what you're doing when you're messing with something this size these would hurt that was my phone these would hurt you they can break an arm and uh once you get into traps this size, you need some of these. These are setting tongs. The way these work, the hook into your spring, the eyes up here like that, and you can compress those springs down. I'm not going to set this one, but compress both. You compress the spring, flip your safety on. A major recommendation for me, you can buy an extra safety that you can clip onto your waders that once you get these traps set, you clip that safety on there and then that gives you three safeties. Because these springs have this safety here and trust me, they can fall off. So you're better off having that extra safety. Safety only takes a few seconds, guys, but trust me, breaking your arm in one of these would be very bad. I know, as goofy as it sounds. I'm going to set the 110 just because uh, it's easier. So the way these traps, and they're all basically the same. Your 330 has the same principle. You got a wire here. This kind of acts as your trigger. And you've got this notched piece here to kind of access the dog. Compress the spring. And bring that up. Okay. Get everything centered up. Get set in the notch. That is now a set trap. Animal comes along, swimming along. Again, you don't want to get in between these. These hurt. <laughs> they, uh, they're not going to break anything, but trust me, I've got my fingers caught in, got my fingers caught in them, and it, it will, it, it smarts pretty bad. So, you know, anytime you're dealing with it, I'm on the safe part, because this is going to close up. So, animal comes along, hits that trigger, make sure my other fingers are out of the way. And... Maybe. <laughs> it closes. There you go. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you get the concept. Now, next traps we're going to go over, and I did not bring one in here, so bear with me one second. All right, we are back. Next thing we're going to talk about is snares. I make my own snares. You can buy them fairly at pretty reasonable prices. They all pretty much act the same. You've got a difference between cable restraints and snares. Is there a difference? Not really. I call these snares. They're cable restraints technically. So check your state laws because everybody's different as with all the traps. You got multi-strand multi cable. This is 1 by 19 332nd cable. They consist of some type of lock. This is a relaxing lock. This is a washer lock. The animal comes along, hits that snare, and it closes down on That right there would have closed down far enough that the coyote's not going to be able to back up and pull out. As he pulls backwards, it's going to tighten up on him. It, but once he stops pulling, it does not tighten anymore that makes a difference between a kill snare and a cable restraint. Now, a lot of states have the state law that you have to have a deer stop. You saw what that did there. 
that is as tight as that trap will close because I've got that deer stop on it. That is so if a deer somehow gets his foot stuck in that trap, it doesn't close tight enough to hold onto that deer. It has nothing to do with catching a deer around the neck. That's where a lot of guys want to start trapping coyotes and they want to go straight to snares because they want to help the deer population. Well guess what? They go out and they do more damage to the deer population because they've not taken their trapper's education and they're setting traps on trails, setting snares on trails and they're not doing it right and they're catching deer. So your typical snares they're all about the same. You've got a lock, you've got swivel on one end which attaches to an extension. You take your extension and you can either have it staked down with an earth anchor, you can wrap your extension around a tree or a fence post if there's one nearby, something immobile, something that's not going to move. And you know, you have some type of snare support system. You know, this is a whammy, it's just a little cone shaped spring. The way that works is you know, these you can buy them also or you can make them. I made these out of 11 gauge wire. I'll stick this end down in the ground and this whammy clips onto that snare support wire. It's kind of hard to do with one hand while I'm trying to hold this thing up. So it's going to sit like that. You know, this snare cable is going to go up that way. And I would have that set. You know, you got a trail coming through here. That's basically how that would be set. Now I've seen pictures of guys getting snares and doing that. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing there. It's going through the snare loop. No. Have you a snare support? Like a whammy, you can get, you can use plastic refrigerator or ice maker line, have that on your snare. Something to where it's going to hold that. And you want it to hold fairly tight because you don't want something to just come up and bump this and that fall off of your support. You want the only thing to move when something gets in that trap or in this snare is that lock. So, like I said, I like these for, you know, if I don't have something nearby to wrap a wire on, you know, I'll use 11 gauge wire and uh, wrap it around the tree. Or if I'm under a fence, I will put the support wire on the fence. I'm not putting, I'm not anchoring it to the fence, but I will put my support wire on the fence to hold that whammy in place at a crawl under. And then this is free to hang and do whatever it needs and close up but you know you can run your extension to a uh, to an earth anchor and do the same thing you have this set on a trail if you don't have any tre trees nearby drive this down in the ground you can actually I've seen where one guy's got a system that he came up with where you wrap your extension cable around here and you've got your earth anchor is attached to this and you drive it all you know into the ground and then attach your snare to it. So that's a pretty good system. That's how snares work. Um, one of the last traps we're going to talk about is dog proof traps. They are all very similar. The only differences other than how they're made and who they're made by and the price is a push trigger or a pull trigger compared to a push pull trigger. Now I've still got the same old one in here. This thing's, I need to put a new bolt in it. This is a Freedom Brand FB1. It's, it's an awesome trap, but yeah, with a lot of moving parts, here's what's happened to it. This is actually what holds it, what sets the trap, and the bolt came out. So if you get FB1s, watch that bolt. They're very easy to replace, it's no big deal. But uh, trap prep, I really don't do much for my dog proofs. I'm a 
they are starting some of them are starting to rust so i'm going to spray paint them this year but uh just clean them up every year they're for raccoons i mean there's not a lot that you really need to do with them uh, well i like to anchor mine i'll actually use my old snares that uh i've, been, I've caught something they're bent up so i can't use them anymore i will take this i'll wrap it around the fence post or a tree run this back through here and my trap's anchored um, but you've got your push pull triggers which are not technically dog proof because a lot of guys i've never caught one but a lot of guys catch end up catching fox in them but yeah we talked about them a little bit on the last episode so i'm not going to go real in depth on it but uh basically the raccoons reach down in for the bait since they have the opposable thumb they can grab that trigger as they pull up spring sets off and that that wire that's in there hopefully you can see it moving catches their paw and holds them there all day long until you get there to them um, that's how the pull trigger works the push pull trigger works either way you know it, it can be set off by pressure going down on it that's how your foxes are getting caught all of them will catch other than raccoons they will catch possums and skunks also so uh, like I said trap prep not really a whole lot make sure they're clean make sure they're working you can paint them whatever however you want to do it you can, I've seen guys paint them pink yellow white makes them much more visible to you a raccoon really doesn't care and an odd collar might actually uh, it may actually attract a, uh, a coon. Let me go grab a different trap because I want to show you guys how to set one of the other types. Okay, I'm back. And I grabbed another, an FB1 that actually, you know, is in good shape. The way these work, you've got this big plate right here. These are great for if you've got, you know, younger kids that are getting into trapping or, you know, maybe your wife wants to get into trapping, your girlfriend. Or if you're like me and you have arthritis issues and your hands hurt, these all you got to do, you squeeze it and it's set. That's the great thing about these. Um, that that is set. The way these work, an animal, like I said, they put their paw down in there and they set it off. Um, the way I'm going to set it off is I'm just going to hit that trigger, and now it's released. But I mean, it's that easy with these. You know, a little kid, yeah, he probably don't have the hand strength even with both hands to do that. But a lot of them have the hand, the strength to put this on the tailgate and push down. Push down on it like that, and that trap's set. So, FB1s are good traps. Like I said, the main thing you got to watch is that screw right there. Because you can't really tighten them up. What I need to do is take a take a, uh, a flat screwdriver and just mess those threads up right there to where that nut can't back off. And that would work for those. Uh, this is a Z trap. The nice thing about Z traps is they come already painted. You can get them white. You can get them brown. I don't know if they have other colors available or not. They come with a few different swivels, but so do your FB ones. This is the way the dog looks on these. It's notched. A lot of people don't understand what that's for. This is your trigger right here. It's got that little protrusion there. The way these are set, same way. You squeeze this in, then you wrap a finger around. And once you get it past the breaking point, you can just one hand it you can hold that and move that dog. Now, that protrusion sets on that little tab right there. Hopefully the camera's picking that up. I hope. That little tab that's at the bottom of that dog is where that needs to sit. That's what makes this a push-pull system, is that notch on that dog right there at the bottom. 
So you see where it's sitting at. You know, if you put it up here somewhere, or if you, I seen a guy one time that was setting them, somehow he had it set where it was going on this part, you know, and here. And that trap's not even gonna work like that. But you put it on that little bottom wing on that dog. So it's just like that. So now that's a very small area. As soon as that trap gets pushed or pulled, it's going to uh, it's going to fire. So uh, those are basically the traps that I use. The only other thing that I can say is cage traps. If you're in a state where it's a requirement that you can only trap with cage traps, then you'd have to deal with that, but my recommendation would be you and all your buddies need to get together with your state trappers association and you guys need to fight because that's that's a very tight constraint you know to have to use cage traps because I mean bobcats yeah you can get a bobcat to get on a cage trap fox I've never caught one in a cage trap and I've done some nuisance work trying to catch them in, in a cage trap um, Coyote, I've seen it done, but I, I don't know how in the world you would get a coyote to commit to a cage trap. And once you get into big, good cage traps, we're not talking uh, tractor supplied cage traps that you can buy for 25 bucks. Those are going to last you. I'm, I've had rack, uh, groundhogs rip right through them before. Um, a good cage trap, coyote size, would probably cost you well over three hundred dollars because I know I pay for my cage traps that I have made by a guy I'll give him a little plug I, I haven't talked to him this year because I haven't needed any more cage traps but uh, it was uh, Double Tap Farms he was outside of Columbus and uh, he was making these traps and they were I think they cost me about ninety dollars a piece a couple years ago no it was last last year I believe I bought them and uh, they are a heavy, heavy duty trap. And you know, if, you, if you're going to use cage traps, buy something extremely heavy duty. I mean, if you can't stand on top of that sucker and bounce around and that trap stays set, it's garbage. If it's got flat, thin, sheet metal doors, it's garbage. Yeah, they're, they're not going to last. But all that said, guys, that is your introduction. Getting to know your traps. Um, yeah, pretty much showed everything I wanted to show. So our next episode, when I get to it, that's going to be weather permitting because I'll have to do it outside. We're going to get into, you know, a couple different types of sets for each type of trap. So it might take me a while to make that one. These ones are okay, you know, I can I can sit out here and just ramble on and talk, but I need to go on location with some of these, like with beaver traps and, you know, the creek traps and stuff. So, uh, you know, anyways, if you have not yet done it, hit subscribe, and uh, we'll see you on the next video, guys. Take care.